Okay, welcome back everyone. Thank you for sticking around. We've got the Bible study coming up here. Um, is that ready to go right away then? Or? Okay. Um, as I mentioned in the prayer, I on my birthday, July 8th, actually coincides with the opening weekend of a new movie. It's called The Sound of Silence. It has to do with uh, child abduction and Sound of Freedom. Sound of Freedom, thank you. Where are we at in the prayer? <laughs> but when we went to see uh, His Only Son, which was the story of Abraham, it was from Angel Productions. It was one of the previews that we saw and the Abraham movie was awesome. And this just looks like it's going to be really intense, really hard hitting. So what I did is I purchased 10 tickets. Nicole and I have two of them. I have eight more to go if anyone wants to go with. If you get more than eight people, I get more than eight to get more tickets. Um, so, but I'm going to show the preview for it. So if anyone's interested in going, you know, just let me know. Tonight, now, we are going to take another chunk out of 1 Kings 22, 
And we're probably not going to finish up the chapter, but I'm not in a race to try to do a chapter a week or anything. But uh, before we get into our study, though, we're going to delve back into our devotional. It is the 11th devotional in the 20 devotional series, and it's on questions. And this is a topic that we've covered already before, God's questions for us. Why does he ask us questions? So if you can recall what I spoke about, not forget what I even spoke about it, so don't feel bad if you can't remember. When God asks you a question, he isn't, oh, it isn't for his education. It is for yours. After Elijah had defeated 450 prophets at Mount Carmel, he became weary and worried to the point of giving up. But the Lord sent an angel to feed the depressed prophet and send him on his way forward. Elijah, nourished by the supernatural fruit of God, traveled 40 days and nights to Horeb, the mouth of God. The Lord came to visit Elijah in the cave of Mount Horeb with a powerful prophetic word. But before the Lord gave Elijah the word, God had a question for the prophet. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. There he went into the cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So what are you doing here? God knew the answer, but still asked the question. Rabbinical educators have always valued the power of a good question. A Hebrew student once asked his teacher, Rabbi, why do you always answer a question with a question? The teacher responded, what's wrong with the question? God's question to Elijah wasn't for God's information. It was for Elijah's destiny. During elementary school years, if my child asked, Dad, what should I choose as the topic for my research paper? My best response was, well, what captures your interests? What do you think is important? God's question to Elijah was designed to put the prophet in touch with the aimlessness of his life so he could hear God's good news of a future and hope. He had accomplished great feats in God's name and traveled a great distance, but he hadn't become still enough to discern the word from the Lord about about his destiny. When God asked Elijah, what are you doing? Elijah, in introspection, had to admit, I'm not really doing anything. I'm aimless. And by asking the prophet what he was doing here, God was helping Elijah to see how far he was from the place of his real mission. Elijah wasn't supposed to be in horror at all. He had run hard and far, but he had traveled far from his appointed destination. Elijah didn't discern the Lord's meaning at first. So after a great wind and shaking, God spoke again in a quiet whisper. What are you doing, Elijah? Then Elijah was ready to hear from God. The Lord gave him instructions for the new phase of his ministry. And Elijah went, well, Elijah went. When God asks you a question, he has a blessing in mind for you. So the questions for reflection. Have you ever felt like God was asking you a question? Is that a yes? Like I said, it just seems like sometimes these answers are getting, I mean, for me, they're getting harder. Because I'm a lifetime Christian, but was not really that close that I would hear from God. It's something I never really had a handle on. Now, there are times I feel like he's asking me, what are you doing? And I'm like, 
Uh, I thought it was what I was supposed to do. But then I realized I'm distracted from what I'm supposed to be doing. So sometimes I find myself having to put things out that I've been doing for years. My big one was Pokemon Go. I gave up Pokemon Go like a year, year and a half ago now, two years, something like that. But I was playing that instead of praying, instead of doing devotionals. I'd go outside at night to pray, and I'd, I'll, I'll just play for five minutes. Hour and a half later, I'm done playing. You know, and I actually feel like I have God asked behind me sometimes what we're doing. Seriously, right? You come outside to pray, not play Pokemon. You know, okay, well. I mean, that's as close as I can honestly come. It's, sometimes I feel more than asking me questions he's telling me. And I'm just trying to get acclimated to doing what he's telling me to do. So. The tired prophet has been encouraged enough by an angel to travel 40 days to a cave in Horeb. What do you think the cave represents? And have you ever been in a cave like that? Figuratively. Sometimes it feels like you're between a rock and a hard place. Those situations. Right. Between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's Actually, I think that's probably how he felt. And could the cave represent safety? Hiding? Lack of responsibility? Because who's going to see it? God. <laughs> yeah, how many times have we tried to run away from our responsibilities and we find a place that we consider our safety place. Like, oh, if I just hide out here, you know, I won't have to do this, this, or this. Kind of felt like the pandemic was kind of the cave for me. The pandemic was the cave for you? You didn't have to deal with real life? Right. That's very true. I think a lot, and I think you're going to get me on this. <clears throat> I really think a lot of people are still using the pandemic as a cave. Yes. Mm-hmm. I understand, and I said it today. <clears throat> as Janet is my witness, I said today in the Bible study, there are people that cannot come to church. I understand that. I get it. And I love the fact that they can watch social media. But I think the pandemic brought out a lot of people's true colors. And a lot of people are still living in that cave and saying, I don't have to do that. I can watch it. You know, you can watch a fireplace on TV too, you're not going to get the warmth. Yeah, it's just my personal opinion, my two cents worth, you know, it's about what it's worth sometimes. But I just think the pandemic really brought out a lot of true colors in people. If God were to appear to you and ask you, what are you doing here? What would be your response? My response now would be a lot different than it was a couple years ago. A couple years ago would be, uh, uh, even now sometimes I don't know, but I'm trying. My response now is, I'm trying to do what you want me to do, and I'm trying to understand. But sometimes I still feel like crawling in that little cave. Anyone else? Yes? I've never been afraid of being out during the pandemic. Didn't bother me at all. I'm more worried about driving at night when I can't see where I'm going. Yeah. Bad weather. Well, see, and that's legitimate, too. And that kind of stuff. When it's daylight, I'm fine. Whenever the doors are open. Okay. Yeah. See, and that, that's, you know, that's legitimate. I mean, like, I was driving. I actually picked up a new fridge last night, but wound up, it was a whole mess. Wound up had to go to New Bloomfield for a truck, for my buddy's truck. Well, I realized how much 
working at night has an effect on me. I'm not used to driving at night like that anymore. And the last word out of his mouth will be careful in my truck. I scared you. Okay, I'm going to say it, guys. I'm going to use the word crap. I'm sorry. I scared the crap out of myself driving that truck in because I'm not used to being on the back roads. I'm not used to driving at night anymore. I'm used to being in the hospital at night or sitting in the office here working. You know, it's a short drive home, but, you know, so I get it when people don't feel comfortable coming out at night, you know. But it's the people without the excuse that that was aimed at, and they knew who they are. You know, I just, and if they get mad at me, I'm, I'm okay with that. But the prayer for the day then, Lord, you know how I thirst for answers. But today I open my, I open my heart to your questions. Give me ears to hear what you are asking. Grant me discernment to not only hear your promptings, but to answer from my deepest heart. Let me not wander a single day aimlessly, but guide me by your steady hand. When I retreat to the comfort of the cave, draw me out into the light. Show me the way, God. I want to follow you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I think this should be a prayer that we pray. I think I said that last week, too. But these prayers are just so, you can say them every day. They're just so detail-oriented. I like that. So just another thought, if we haven't already covered it, why did God ask us questions when he already knows the answer to them? To make us think. And I believe another large part of it is so that we have to take responsibility and formulate an answer. But then we also have to determine whether we're going to answer honestly or not. And as absurd as that sounds, think of, well, we'll get to that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, we're not going to try to answer God with a lie. Because we should all know better. But we still do sometimes. We don't want to examine ourselves for the truth. When God asks us a question, though, we already know that he knows the truth. And the reason he's asking is to get us to soul search, just like the same reason we should pray for stuff, even though God already knows. Sometimes when we're asking God for something, the way that we're asking shows us whether it's a need or a want. And it might actually change our perspective on what we're asking for. Plus, it humbles us to know that we are asking permission for something. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? Did God ask this because he honestly didn't know where Adam was hiding? No. He asked this so that Adam had to admit that he messed up. He had to confess his sin. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, this was actually a new thought for me. This popped into my head last night. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why do you think Jesus asked him that question? To set straight in Saul's mind who he was and make him question his own beliefs. Saul thought he was doing the will of God by persecuting the Christians. So I honestly believe that the most effective way to make him understand was to knock him off onto the ground and say, why are you persecuting me? And then Saul would be sitting there going, huh? I thought I was doing your will, but if you're asking me that, apparently I'm wrong. And I think that may have been the point of conversion for Saul when he realized that he was persecuting God. And it was all because of God's question. Genesis chapter 18, verse 9. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? 
I believe Jesus asked that to get her attention because she was within earshot. But when she heard her name, that grabbed her attention. And then in verses 13 through 15, And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. For she was afraid, and he said, No, you did laugh. So was Jesus trapping Sarah by asking her, by inviting her into the conversation? Or do you think maybe he was just bringing to the forefront her disbelief? And the fact that he can do whatever he wants. He was also asking the second question for the same purpose as the one he asked Adam and Eve. He was calling her out and making her soul search. Why did I laugh? And that brought to the forefront for her her disbelief. So with that, any further questions, comments, suggestions? I didn't even think about that. When, Ken, when God asked Cain, where's your brother? Well, I'm not a brother's keeper. You know, I, and I was, that just brought to mind another one. No, I'll think of it later. But no, I hadn't even thought about that one, but yeah. I mean, he didn't answer either way. He was just so hardened that he didn't care. Well, let's get back into 1 Kings 22 then. We're going to recap last week. We saw that there were three years of peace for Ahab, but Ben-Hadad had not followed through on his part of the truce agreement. But this only came to a head as something that they might want to try to take care of once Jehoshaphat came to visit Ahab. And we saw in verse 3, the king of Israel had said to his officials, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and yet we are not doing anything to retake it from the king of Aram? Well, he said this to his officials, but he said it in front of Jehoshaphat, hopefully to get him on board, because he knew he couldn't do it without him. Now, Jehoshaphat, and I'm still confused about this, why he compared himself to Ahab. He said, yeah, we're, we're, we're exactly alike. Our people are alike. My horses are your horses. Now, Jehoshaphat and his people were true followers of Jehovah. They were not idolaters like Ahab and his people. But, I'm sure it not in time. And like I said, uh, looking, I think it was in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, I think, <coughs> The same exact thing is chronicled there in the King's Chronicles. And it says that God was not happy with Jehoshaphat for this. But because he had did away with all the temples and all the Asherah poles and all that, he was still in God's grace. So, But this was Jehoshaphat's way of showing support and allegiance to Ahab. And Jehoshaphat, true to form though, requested that they inquire of the Lord what they should do. So Ahab brought out his 400 prophets and as we discussed they were false prophets of course but he inquired of them what they should do and of course they're people pleasers and they tried to please Jehoshaphat and Ahab they tried to appease Jehoshaphat by using the name Yahweh and they were using the verbiage, and they appeased Ahab by saying, yeah, go ahead. You'll get it. You got this. Go team. But Jehoshaphat's next question secures the fact for me that they were false prophets, and that he was not buying into their show attempts to appease them. 
And Ahab's response also shows me that Ahab was aware of it as well. But he's okay with it because he still heard what he wanted to hear. But for verses 7 and 8, we had, But Jehoshaphat asks, Is there no longer a prophet of the Lord from whom we can inquire of? The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, uh, The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me. So I'd like to reiterate a quote also that I believe brings to light the attitude of us sometimes about God. Not us specifically, but collectively as humans. Two conflicting opinions of Jehoshaphat and Ahab regarding the institution of prophecy are visible in this episode. Jehoshaphat regarded a prophet as an instrument of God to reveal God's will to a community. Whereas Ahab regarded a prophet as an agent of the throne to influence God. And I think that's very evident there is what's going on. But Ahab admits that he hates Micaiah, who is the prophet, because he never said anything good about him. Anything he prophesies is bad. Well, maybe Ahab should think long and hard about it. I mean, he just put up with Elijah for how long? He knows that the things he's doing are wrong, but he still thinks he can do it. But while we were waiting for Micaiah to arrive, the 400 prophets were put on quite a shell, made iron horns, act like bulls, you got to push the enemy back. And the person that went to get Micaiah said, hey, the 400 prophets that are there are already saying he's going to do a good job. Just agree with him, let go. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. When he arrives, the king asked him, oh, this is picking up in verse 14, sorry. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Now, I really wish that attitude would show up in text because I'd love to hear how this came out of his mouth. But verse 16, the king said to him, How many times must I make you swear if you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So it must have been in a way that was obviously enough, sarcastic enough, that Ahab knew he was making fun of him. Or not untruthful as much as probably mocking the other prophets. But it was enough anyhow to make Ahab have him swear to the truth. And judging from the way as it was stated, it was not the first time Micaiah had done this. Because Ahab's response was, how many times must I make you swear to tell me the truth? Now I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Ahab actually doesn't want to know. Oh, he actually does want to know what the Lord wants him to do. He just doesn't want to do it. I mean, if he truly didn't want to know, he would have said, okay, cool, they all agree, 401 of them, let's go. He would have ignored the sarcasm. He doesn't want to call Micaiah in the first place because he knows what he'll say. Then he'll get outraged when Micaiah agrees with the other prophets and for forces him to tell the truth that he still doesn't want to hear. And looking at other sources, they add to the fact that not only did Micaiah agree with the other prophets, but in a sarcastic tone, he also used their verbiage, which is nonsensical and could mean anything. And if you listen to it, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, go up and prosper, which is the same as the other prophets said. But he was saying it in mockery. And in this next part, and I think we hit on this last week, now, the way that it's worded doesn't give an answer either way. And Jehovah will deliver it into the hands of the king. 
Now, if you call from commentaries, look at the last clause, which has that same crooked and deceitful prophecy that the false prophets had spoken with the meaning that God will deliver. God will deliver what? He'll deliver Ahab, perhaps Ben-Hadad, into the hands of the king. Which king? Into Ahab's hands? Into Ben-Hadad's hands? Or will he deliver both of them into Jehoshaphat's hands? There's no guidance in what's said. It's all just to sound happy. That being said, and also note that Micaiah did not say, thus saith the Lord. He in no way, shape, or form said that this was God's word. It was just the first thing that came out of his mouth when he got there. So picking up in verse 17, Micaiah gives the word of the Lord. Then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you that he never prophesied anything good about me, but only bad? So Ahab challenged Rechiah to tell the truth, but he not only didn't want to know the truth, he couldn't handle it. Micaiah didn't start out this time, or Micaiah, Micaiah? Now, basically what I just said anyhow, when Micaiah first said it, he didn't start out with, thus saith the Lord. But this time he used the phrase, well this time he said, I saw, which he's saying that he saw a vision from God. And then in the next phrase, he does say, hear the word of the Lord. But Ahab knew in his heart that Micaiah would not fear or flatter him, but only declare the word of Jehovah. This he construed into personal hatred, though. And hatred of the messenger of God is a clear evidence of willful wickedness. But this is also something that Jesus warned us about anyhow. So we shouldn't be surprised. It was happening then, it's happening now. John 15, I don't know if I'll read the whole thing, but 18 to 23. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my old teachings, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. And that goes the same for us. When people hate what we're saying when we're speaking the gospel, it's not personal. You know, yeah, they might hate us because we love God, but that's only because they hate God. Yeah, you know, it's when the uh, word of God convicts you, it's kind of hard to feel all nice and friendly sometimes. Picking up in verse 19, Micaiah continued, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab? into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there. One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. 
By what means, the Lord asks. I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Now at this point in time, I was going to call a night and have you guys all think about this until next week. Because I honestly had no idea what to think about this. There are certain times I'm doing my studies and I have my own thoughts. And then I start looking at commentaries, and okay, you know, and I see what I agree with, and it has to be biblical, though, because there's a lot of stuff in commentaries that is not biblical, and it doesn't fit. Well, I couldn't find anything that fit until I was getting ready to call it night, close everything down, or call it day, it was actually this afternoon, and, and something jumped out at me that I was closing down. And it led me on a rabbit trail. It led to a rabbit trail. It led to a rabbit trail that actually led to an answer. So we are going to continue. And I hope I don't lose you on this. So I don't know how this is going to come out. But there are many different thoughts on this as there are as many different thoughts as there are commentaries. David Guzik says that the deceiving spirit was Satan. And I know the argument is that sin is not allowed in front of God. But I ask you to consider Job. Satan held audience with God. But Satan couldn't do anything to Job without God's permission. You know, so I'm okay with that. But different thoughts, I do understand that God does not need to ask around for somebody, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? How do you think we should do this? I don't think God actually had that conversation. So this means that I believe this was in the form of a parable. What he saw, I believe, he was putting out there in a way that they could understand. Or maybe it was given to him this way, too. And some have even commented that uh, it's an indication contrary to the Bible that God can tempt or cause people to sin by sending deceiving spirits. Because they're saying if God's sending evil spirits and deceiving spirits, then God's tempting people. But isn't James that tells us that you can't say God tempted me? Or is this a human way of explaining God hardening someone's heart, like Pharaoh? An example that Kaufman Commentaries gives, and I wasn't 100% in agreement with this, but I can explain it later, afterwards. The statement here that lying spirit was from the Lord fails to satisfy many modern minds. But it is consistent with other scriptures. See Paul's statement above, and we'll get to that then. Also, see 1 Samuel 16, 14, which speaks of the evil spirit from the Lord that tormented Saul. The sending of the evil spirit from the Lord should be regarded as done by the permissive will of God, and even then, only at a time when the irrevocable nature of the sinner's rebellion against God is fully revealed. Ahab had had ample chances to know the truth, first from Elijah and then from Micaiah. And I actually, I looked up the first Samuel one, first Samuel 16, 14, and it was where David was anointed by Samuel and in verse 14 it says, Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now this is very important. Because he who is in us is stronger than he who is in the world. And you know that if Christ is in us, we cannot be possessed. Satan cannot get into us if Christ is already in us. 
But what I found in relation to this is in line with what was going through my head. But I wasn't sure how to say it, but David Guzik actually put a good one out. And this is in reference to the first Samuel passage. A distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. If God is all good, why did he send a distressing spirit upon Saul? There are two senses in which God may send something. He may send something in an active sense, or he may send something in a passive sense. Actually, God never initiates or performs evil. I think we can all agree on that. He is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And that is from James chapter 1 verse 17. Passively, God may withdraw the hand of his protection and therefore allow evil to come without being the source of the evil itself. This is indicated by what happened with Saul first. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. This meant Saul lost his spiritual protection and covering. So Satan was more than ready to send a distressing spirit to fill the void in Saul. <coughs> this is why the continual presence of the Holy Spirit for all Christians is such a comfort. We don't have to fear that God will take his Holy Spirit from us. Some of this section, I hope I did. Okay, I'll find another video later. I actually brought Jesus Iscariot into it, too. I just can't remember if I did it, if I missed it or what, but I don't know. It's like they're in front of me. First John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's the verse that I was at later. But actually, this is the same thing that happened to Judas Iscariot as well. This used to be a question of mine. When Jesus gave him the bread and he partook of it, what does it say? Satan entered him. I believe that he never actually accepted Jesus the whole time he was with him. I believe that Jesus turned him over to his own evil desires and turned him over to Satan, giving Satan a free pass. Just like in Romans chapter 1, God turned the vile over to their evil desires. I believe Jesus did the same thing to Judas. But I also believe that Jesus, Jesus kept Judas around the whole time knowing what he was going to do. Because he needed Judas to set the wheels in motion for prophecy, scriptural reasons, and he had to die. And Judas was the one that, you know, he had it in his heart to do it. And as I was closing out the tab with the first Samuel commentary, something else jumped out at me, and I think we can all agree on this. Either at times in our life or when we're being convicted and we don't want to be, or through others that we know, what, you know, this sometimes is our thoughts. Saul clearly had the Spirit of the Lord upon him at one time. As he was proud and rebellious against God, Saul resisted the Holy Spirit. He told the Holy Spirit, no, and go away, so many times that God finally gave Saul what he wanted. But Saul never realized the price to pay when the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. Saul thought he would be freer to do his thing without the Spirit of the Lord bugging him. He didn't realize he would be in even more bondage to the distressing spirits that troubled him. 
How many times does the Holy Spirit convict us and we're like, you know what? Leave me alone. I know where I'm going. Not so much anymore, but I used to be that way. When I refer to, I was afraid to give my life to Christ because it was going to ruin my life. The one that he gave to me anyhow. You know, I didn't want to give up my ways of doing things because they were fun. For the most part. I have a different idea of fun now. But one other thing that was said by Colin Kaufman's commentary about the passage from Paul, and I understand what he's saying, that he doesn't give it, it he doesn't give it in context. And it makes it very vague. And the passage is 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. This is the context that it's given him. Well, this is the context that he gives. And all the ways the wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth, and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. This is actually all dealing with end-time prophecy. And you probably wouldn't get that just from those two verses. But verses 5 through 9 of the same chapter, do you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back. This is about the man of lawlessness, I didn't say that. And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so, that being the Holy Spirit, till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, and whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth, and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Oh, I don't know where I was going with that. Not sure why I put that in there, but... I put it in there because I know there's a lot of questions about the Antichrist and the coming of the Antichrist and the Holy Spirit holding me back and stuff like that. But like I said, here's another one where it says that the Lord is going to allow the Holy Spirit to step back and allow the Antichrist to take over. So in essence, that's the same thing that we're looking at also. And I know that was a really big rabbit trail from where we started. And I apologize if I lost anyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and call it a night, though. If that's all right with everyone. Before I get anyone else lost. Like I said, I don't know half of what was on here. This is what was given to me. And I'm just going with it. I can't believe I found half of what I found. But thank you, God. Somebody has to know. Somebody was questioning it. Thank you. So with that, then, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this word. I just pray, Father, that it went out a lot better than I think it did in my head. I was putting it out as you gave it to me, and I just pray that there was somebody out there that needed to hear that, Lord God. I just pray that you'll take us from here tonight, Lord God, and just give us Give us a peaceful night. Give us safety on the way home. And Heavenly Father, unless you're going to rapture us tonight, I just pray that you'll allow us to wake up again, once again tomorrow, to take your word into a lost and sick world, to share your word with those who need it, to witness for you and to minister for you, Lord God. Just pray that you'll bless everyone that was here, bless everyone that's watching, everyone that will watch. And just bring it back again safely, Lord God. Pray this in the holy and precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope you guys aren't as mind blown as I am. I just
just feel like I went through a blender. That's what I was talking about, Bill. Same thing happened this afternoon, Bible study. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about that. Next week, we will finish up 21. 22. 22. That's right. We're in Genesis 21. Genesis 21, 1 Kings 22. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, thank you.